welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author is Carrie Gress, new to Bookmark. The book is The Marian Option, God's Solution to a Civilization in Crisis, published by Tan Books, and boy, can we mm -hmm. use it now. Pleasure <laughs> to meet you. Likewise. Um, some of our viewers would have seen you on with Father Mitch back in the fall. Right. Uh, and we're talking about something called The Marian Option. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people in the last couple of years have heard about this book called The Benedict Option. Mm -hmm. Is there a relationship between the Benedict Option and the Marian Option? Sure. Um, it, in fact, I probably wouldn't have written this book if it weren't for the Benedict Option, but um, I started out trying to understand the Benedict Option. I was kind of fascinated by it. Rod Dreyer wrote a lot about the concept of, and uh, recognizing the, the connections between the fall of the Roman Empire and, and the moral crumbling that we're seeing mm -hmm. in, in America today. And so his ideas really, initially it started out as kind of a, a call to retreat, that people needed to uh, you know, move to more rural areas and, and sort of shore up their communities and whatnot. Kind and, of like lay monasticism or right, something. Exactly. In some ways, right, exactly. And he's kind of hedged that and now has really said you can do it in an urban setting mm -hmm. and whatnot. So he's sort of changed his position. But um, one of the things that, um, that I saw that was um, interesting was just the recognition that we've got in the example of John Paul II, mm -hmm. someone who's lived under under Christian persecution like mm -hmm. nobody else. And I, I wrote a book with George Weigel called City of Saints. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing that book, it just jumped off the page at me, uh, you know, looking at the, all this research. But he offers us this field guide of wow. how it is that we can live under Christian persecution. Yeah. Um, so from there, it was, you know, a logical jump to, well, what was it that animated John Paul II's soul? And of course, it was Christ and, and his mother and this mm -hmm. deep relationship that, that uh, John Paul II had with Mary. Um, so. Finally, the, mm -hmm. the last piece of the, the puzzle was to really see that all the things that concern mm -hmm. us today, whether it's heresies, it's evangelization, mm -hmm. it's secularism, that Mary has dealt with these things in spades and mm -hmm. in, in throughout history. Right. And um, so I started researching, you know, things like evangelization. Well, the, the largest, uh, you know, evangelization that happened in one place that we actually have histor historical records of was Our Lady of Guadalupe. Guadalupe, obviously, right. just in time in relation to the Reformation, too, at exactly, the time. Exactly, right? exactly. Yeah. Um, so it, it just struck me that that right. while the, the Benedict Option has a lot of great um, elements mm -hmm. to it, that I think the Marian Option is actually much more fundamental right. and I think more timely, and, and we can talk about that as well, okay. um, for what it is that we're dealing with well, on our culture now. Well, you say the Marian Option, in a sense, you say the idea for the book certainly didn't come in a flash, rather it was a culmination of many different events. You talk about uh, giving a talk, writing an article, et right. cetera, right. and you say the, the Marian Option unfolded to me. What do you mean right. it unfolded to you? Well, it was something that just was not readily apparent. I think mm -hmm. some people have said, you know, the, um, made other options like the, the Gregory option or the Dominic option or all, mm -hmm. all kinds of different ways that people would look at different saints' lives and say, and you this, talk is, about that in the book, right, this right. is who we need to emulate. Mm -hmm. And um, with Mary, it was much more subtle, but I think, it, you know, looking back at the way that she's been involved, not only in, in the saints' lives, but mm -hmm. also in geopolitics, all of these different ways that she's been involved, it suddenly started to become clearer and clearer that she really was the right. antidote to, to the, the problems that we have in our own age. And this is, I think, the beauty that we can see in the right. church, too, is that Christ offers us these antidotes right. in di different saints when there are problems in the faith. You said there's a growing sense of unease in the world today. How do you see that? <laughs> How do you not see that, I think? Uh, you know, just reading reading the news t mm -hmm. um, today, any... any well, is it because the world's worse so we just get pummeled with it? Well, I think it's a combination. I think okay. that it's we certainly get pummeled with it, so it's, it's much more on the forefront of our minds. Um, but I think that additionally there is the, the massive problem of you know, 3,000 abortions in this country a day mm -hmm. that we can't, it's sort of incomparable when you, when you look at um, the world and its history and mm -hmm. as far as the damage that that has produced within the family, um, within women, within right. men, uh, all of those dynamics. So I think it's, it's it's worse in that respect, and I think that there, there's some intentionality to that. Mm -hmm. I think that's another reason why Our Lady is, is such a great antidote to um, these problems that we face mm -hmm. that have come from um, abortion and contraception. You say mocking and disparaging Catholicism is called the last acceptable form of bigotry. No other group has continued to hold a strong line on life, family, and marriage, the fundamentals of any flourishing society. The mm -hmm. church and the members will continue to pay a price for defending the most defenseless and upholding the law written within our hearts. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're still doing that? The, f the faithful are, are the standing okay? up. 
I think um, there are certainly pockets of it. Or is concern with the Benedict option that maybe that was that would be an avenue to say we should retreat from that? Right. No, I think that uh, we are standing. I think that this is we're holding the line um, in in many instances right. for these issues. There's no other voice out there uh, that's really has the depth of theology right. as well as the social understanding right. of, of uh, fighting. So you saw these Charles issues. Rice as a bit of a prophet. I did. Yeah. Yeah, Charlie Rice is was a, a professor at Notre Dame, a law professor, and um, back in the 80s, 90s, even the 70s, would say, you know, gay marriage is going to happen because of the pill, and people just laughed at him and thought this is ridiculous. Of course, it would never, we, there would never be gay gay marriage, and yet this is where we sit today. Right. Um, and um, well, yeah, so I think he really was. Is one of the things that's striking to you not only the idea that let's say this has occurred in our culture mm -hmm. with a greater rapidity than people expected mm -hmm. but there seems to be because of a lack of understanding of history as if well we always believe this right. or at least we always should have believed <laughs> right this. exactly that it's suddenly become terribly obvious that that in fact this should have been the case and i think that's really where we can see the, a, a spirit moving in our culture mm -hmm. It's really dangerous and, um, and and unnerving because of that. But um, much of it happens because of the mass media and because of, of very clever marketing. But again, that comes back mm -hmm. to the pill where you've got heterosexuals having relations that are in many ways just about pleasure and therefore mm -hmm. there's not much different about right. homosexual or heterosexual uh, sexual relationships. Or gender uh, right. is a construct. Ex yes, exactly. Right. It's all very fluid. So, right, right. no, it's um, it's troubling how quickly it's happened. Well, well, you say the Marian option offers the key to personal and societal transformation in ways that no other saint or noble leader can, precisely mm -hmm. because of who she is, the mother of God, our spiritual mother. Mm -hmm. and then you go on to talk about a type of spiritual hunkering down. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the difference between a Benedict option <laughs> kind of receding and a hunkering down? Right. Well, I think it's... Hunkering down, I imagine, you don't have to change your location. You don't have to go um, get a new job. You, you know, the, it's mm -hmm. a matter of doing where, being where you already are, but just starting to pray more and starting to really work on this relationship mm -hmm. with Our Lady and, and fostering that. And that's really the, the heart of this, is focusing on that, that relationship. Because, of course, Our Lady always brings us yeah. to Christ. So when we go through her, it's much easier to get to Him. Well, it's interesting. You say finding the real Mary, you, you talk about the challenge of people seeing the rosary leading to real change and somebody mm -hmm. say well how many books do we need on the rosary you know, right. say the rosary right. I don't like the rosary it's boring <laughs> it's to me boring. Right. but uh, you know old people like the rosary but then you mm -hmm. say one ironic hurdle to understanding Mary has come in the form of unapproved Marian apparitions and then you go and actually quote our friend Michael O'Neill mm -hmm. the miracle right. hunter miracle who, we, hunter. who we've done right. work with uh -huh. uh, so what, what do you mean why, why is that a, a hurdle to understanding Mary um, apparitions, you mean? The unapproved apparitions. Oh, the unapproved apparitions. Well, I, I'm in my own life, I found it a hurdle because I just couldn't keep up with all of them. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of different, con there's a lot of content there, um, and it's it can be overwhelming. And I think I, in my own life, I just had a complete absence of peace mm -hmm. when I would would spend a lot of time with these Marian apparitions and some of the messages from them. And I, I kind of got to the point where I couldn't reconcile different pieces of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I just thought, you know, I need to retreat from this and just focus on the sacraments right. and focus on, on what I know, you know, the church is calling right. me to. Right, which is what we do, obviously, here, too. Right. And so, as a result, in this book, I only used, uh, I think there are 15 Vatican-approved Marian apparitions. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think I only used about nine right. of them. Um, but I also didn't want it to be something where I had to go back you know, years later and change things because things had been decided, debunked or, you know, right, you know okay. whatnot. So, right. um, and I think also there's a lot of sensationalism around Marian apparitions that um, can tend to draw our focus away right. uh, in, um, in, a, in a way that's not necessarily and maybe healthy. Maybe because they're, they're kind of so extreme or out there that right. it appears superstitious or right. so clearly isn't true or, mm -hmm. or is being overplayed to right. the fact that it kind of puts a, a, a pallor on everything. Sure. Right. And, you know, like everything, I think that you can strike the right balance mm -hmm. of the two. I mean, there's obviously incredible fruit and, and importance to things like Lourdes right. and, and Fatima and many of these apparitions. It's interesting sites, you, you mentioned Lepanto here, mm -hmm. obviously, in the world we live in today, uh, and Our Lady of Guadalupe, which you mentioned earlier. But you also talk about the fact that it's not just what happened, but the backstory behind it. Sure. Why? 
uh, well, partially because I think it's fascinating, um, but also because most people don't know the backstory. I know I didn't know the backstory. I mean, I had no idea all these incredible connections between, but you know, pushing this, the Moors out of Spain. That I, I had I didn't even realize that the Moors were in Spain right. for 800 years. I mean, I knew there was a chunk of time, but I didn't realize it was Not that long. Not people saw the movie El Cid, or they were right, the exactly. Right, right. I, I never saw El Cid, <laughs> but um, and I think just that what I was able to do with some of this research was tie t together links that um, we don't naturally think mm -hmm. of between many of the apparitions and, and the different um, right. ways that Mary has helped geopolitically throughout right. history. Now you talk about simplicity is not the same as superficiality. Why right. do you want to make that point? Well, I think sometimes that we think that um, even a, a relationship with Mary um, or, or the rosary, these things that are very simple in, in what they are, um, that they're not going to have any deep effects, and, mm -hmm. and it's just going to be kind of a fluff or waste of time or just sort of a saccharine, uh, you know, pious devotion. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, there is something incredibly deep about right. this this relationship that we can foster with Our Lady that she she calls right. us to, and I think it also has deep roots and and deep tentacles that go out into the rest of the the culture as well. It's mm -hmm. not just we pray the rosary. It's not just something that helps us, but in fact, there's this right. incredible ripple effect. Right. Um, to it as well. Prayer has creative minorities. Who are they? <laughs> um, well, creative minorities are these groups that uh, the historian Arnold Toynbee, mm -hmm. who studied very rigorously the 26 major civilizations that have happened in, in the world um, since the beginning of recorded have history. Risen and fallen. Right. And um, he's, he's the one that said um, civilizations commit suicide, they're not murdered. Right. And, but one of the things that I found so hopeful about his work on mm. these civilizations was the recognition that there is usually a small creative minority that in, in fact helps transform the culture right. and either changes it back or it turns it into something new. And um, so the creative minority, I think what we have seen, we can mm -hmm. see in the last really millennia is that Our Lady has been at the heart of these creative minorities that have transformed culture. Do you think there's also creative minorities on the other side? I think they're destructive minorities. That's what I mean, in, yeah. the, in the sense of the right. fact, uh, yeah, creative in quotes, in the sense yeah. of it doesn't always take, and that's what you make the point here, mm -hmm. uh, or he, he, quoting him, these emerging civilizations rose not from massive populist movements, mm -hmm. but from the virtues of small creative minorities on the positive side. Right. We can also see on the negative side that many right. of the changes sometimes we see happening in, in society around us are not driven by the mass of people. Mm -hmm. They right. can be driven by no. very small groups. And I think that's an, a great point because this is exactly what we're seeing, um, especially with women's issues. I mean, it's very much controlled by New York, Washington, um, the music industry, and Hollywood. These are and the media. Um, mm -hmm. These are the these are why you know women think kind of in a lockstep way mm -hmm. about what it means to be a woman and and how it is that we've gotten to believe that somehow abortion is is part of our femininity. I mean, it's it's incredible how far we've gotten and how right. much we've absorbed as a culture um, in, in this kind of destruction. Right. You said that Toynbee suggests two ways in which creative minorities affect a shift in culture. First is to drill a message into the minds of the unthinking masses, mm -hmm. perhaps through something like social media, like mm -hmm. you just said. Right. Second is to use what Toynbee calls a mystic. Mm -hmm. The second way comes from those creative individuals who are able to enter the world but also exit it through prayer. Right. The mystic is this kind of individual like St. Benedict of Norcia mm -hmm. or like um, uh, Pope St. Gregory the Great who spent uh, you know, three years in prayer and, and all this time really coming to know the heart and mind of God. But also in that time away, God plants something, a seed that then flourishes when they go back into society. So we can see this with St. Benedict very clearly where he comes back into the world and he brings the world monasticism, which is, of course, what saved so much of Western civilization and then ended up becoming flowering really into Christendom. Mm. Um, so there's these kind of individuals um, that we, th these mystics that we can see planted at different stages uh, throughout history. St. Francis would be another one. The church is choking with um, riches and he comes along as the little poor man. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of these are, are very Marian, I, I think, in the latter stages of in the last, you know, 500 years. Now, when you spent time in Italy, did you go to St. Mary of something? I, <laughs> <laughs> I went to many St. Mary's of something, something. Yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I lived right next to Santa Maria uh, in Trasevere, so yes, that okay. was um, plenty of St. Mary's. There's 90 churches named after Our Lady in Rome alone, so mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to miss them, but um, yeah, no, and they're very What do you think prolific. that shows? It shows... 
how well, important our Blessed Mother has been to the church, to the uh, people who... Absolutely. I think that's, that's part of it. I mean, it's hard to find a town, in, certainly in Europe, that doesn't have a church named after Our Lady. And I right. think it's really the fact that she has shown herself to be such an, a, right. a mother that it is always at hand and when we need right. her. And a lot of the votive offerings that you see in these churches in Europe, you know, the, the crutches or the glasses or the paintings. Right. And there's even Our Lady of um, Gasalo, who there's right. um, bicycles. It's, she's a, a, a patroness of bicycle riders, and there's all kinds of jerseys. and. Right. And, and bicycles that have been offered by people who've been spared from some accident or something. Right. Um, so yeah, she's her her influence is seen in all of these little churches that dot dot the con those countries. Now you also say that there's a story here about Henry Adams. <laughs> yes, now, the Protestant uh, Henry Adams. Yeah, John Quincy Adams, mm -hmm. uh, you know, grandson and great grandson of John Adams, mm -hmm. and he makes some point about Our Lady. Right. Well, I have in the book I have a chapter on Our Lady's role in culture, and I, I think it's just indisputable that she has been a huge influence in culture. And John Adams um, is is someone that at the turn of the century he went to the World's Fair and he saw a um, the automobile. It was the first automobile he had seen, and he mm -hmm. he called it the Dynamo. And in this essay, um, he also explains that as soon as he sort of stepped away mm -hmm. from the, the automobile and, and after kind of absorbing how much it would change the world, he then went back to thinking about mm -hmm. Mary and, and how it is that she, you know, there's there's no one or nothing that has changed the world as dramatically right. as she has. And of course, he's in, living in Europe at this time. He's looking at these gorgeous Gothic cathedrals that mm -hmm. have been named for her and that were influenced or inspired by her and all this artwork. Mm -hmm. He's looking at music. He's looking at philosophy, all of these kinds of areas where Mary's influence is clearly present. Now, does Our Lady wear combat boots? <laughs> you know, I don't know if she does or not, but she really should um, mm -hmm. if she does not, because she's, I think we think of her in very saccharine or, or pious terms, but in fact, she's, mm -hmm. she's pretty intense when you right. look at the role that she's played, uh, particularly in battles right. um, like Lepanto right. or um, like helping Spain right. free itself from the Islamic um, occupation. Right. So she's been, she's tough. Well, well in, in researching this book and, and talking about Our Lady and some of those things where there are historical incidents mm -hmm. where the church was forced, let's say, to defend itself or Western civilization right. was, do you think to some degree we downplay that too much today in the sense mm -hmm. of, you know, we don't want to be militaristic or mm -hmm. triumphalistic and mm -hmm. so, you know, yeah. all that kind of gets downplayed. I don't want to be a spiritual warrior. Well, right. you know. Well, I think that's that's a really great point. I think much of it goes sort of hand in hand with our um, very emotional culture that we live in because these are those are tough things to wrap your mind around as far as the, the battle. I mean, we, we don't even understand what it means to go buy your meat. You know, doesn't meat come packaged in plastic and styrofoam? I mean, the way that we purchase it. So we, we've become very mm. removed from the, the realities that I think for centuries people live with. And for many, in many ways, this is obviously a, a, a wonderful thing right. that we are spared from it. But at the same time, this is something that, right. that we need to be mindful of and be aware of because we're not that far right. um, from it, the, the, the right. steps from, you know, a culture that's, that's fall, crumbling to these darker areas is really not that far. Right, and of course, some of the uh, British historians actually blamed Christianity for the fall of Roman Empire and said they right. made it soft, etc. Right. Now, in chapter seven, Mariolatry versus Mariology, there is mm -hmm. something of an internal struggle that exists for many Christians about how much or how little to honor Mary. So, mm -hmm. can we have distortions? Sure. I mean, there have been distortions. People turn her into a goddess and, and you know, cut Christ out of the picture completely, and um, and the church has always denounced those. But I think that um, St. Maximilian Kolbe's great point that you can't love Mary too much because we can never love like Christ loves. We can never love Mary like Christ loves her. So it's it's uh, it's almost impossible right. to get to that stage where we can love her too well, we, much. We talked about the idea of the history behind some of the apparitions you make. Even the Aztecs worshipped the goddess Tenatzin, yeah, who I, was I, honored on Tepeyac Hill before Our Lady appeared there. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, no, it's fascinating how you can see that also in um, in Rome, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, where she's on top of the the, the goddess of Minerva's um, site. So yeah, it's you see the supplanting going on, where our Our Lady is taking over um, these goddesses that mm -hmm. have been worshipped and, and and just putting things in in order and in, in the properly proper way that they ought to be, uh, you know, on earth. Mm -hmm. 
So you're a philosopher. <laughs> I am. Um, so you agree with the subtle doctor? I like the subtle doctor and the immaculate conception and his, uh, his work on that. I think there's a lot to be said for Duns Scotus. And he wasn't really a dunce. He was no dunce. In <laughs> fact, he, he, he irritated people because he was so subtle. Mm. Um, and that's why he, the, the dunce cap arose. It was for, from irritation, not from stupidity. Um, but yeah, he's a challenging right. thinker, that's for sure. It's interesting. We're, we're just coming out of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. A lot mm -hmm. of people point out that Luther wasn't personally anti-Marian, but you mm -hmm. say right. he opened the door to a scorched, scorched earth policy about mm -hmm. Mary. Yeah, yeah. I, I, this has been a fascinating piece to see. First off, that that Luther had a Marian devotion and mm -hmm. and said very laudatory things about her, and yet because of the, so many things being tossed out, um, people thought that it was probably time to toss Mary out of out of their faith as well because it smacked too much of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. um, and now we can see that even in trying to have a discussion with. Protestants about this is very difficult mm -hmm. because um, of the the sola scriptura. I mean, obviously she's mentioned in scripture. But there's almost this kind of allergy where they feel like maybe if we we have this appreciation for Mary, that it's going to take away from our devotion to Christ. Instead of looking right. at it as a family unit, um, that you can right. you can love both. You can love both well, your father and your mother. You know that the, they work together. Well, if you if you have an aversion to intercession in a sense through the priesthood, why wouldn't right. you have an, inter, an aversion to any other intercessor exactly. between you and point. Christ? Right. Mm -hmm. but maybe be part of it too. Yes. You also talk about the fact that today with feminism, mm -hmm. um, that the old notion of Mary is simply too outdated perhaps. Right. Even in mainstream Catholic circles, Mariology has been reduced to s trying to see Mary through a more human lens, mm -hmm. such as a believer, disciple, or friend, minus deeper theological strings. What mm -hmm. would be an example of that that you've seen? You know, there are a series of books that I, I discovered that I hadn't run across before in any of my reading, but when I was researching this that I found, and, and it was really, this the articulation was this idea that, uh, you know, Mary is, um, she's too pious, she's too meek, she's too quiet. Um, you know, all of these things that I, I think are not virtues that we, we uphold in, in society at this stage. And so mm -hmm. the idea was really, you know, let's put her in a pantsuit and make her someone that we can relate to. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I think that's what's what's fascinating about it. Instead of saying, you know, maybe we've gone off the rails and, mm -hmm. and we're going in the wrong direction, it's, you know, we got to change Mary, right. um, even though she's been said to be the most powerful woman in history. Right. And um, right. ironically, right. she's the one that has given us our dignity in the first place as women. Right. As Blessed John Henry Cardinal Newman pointed out, son and mother went together, and the experience of three centuries have confirmed their testimony. For Catholics who have honored the mother still worship the son, while Protestants who now have ceased to confess the son began then by scoffing at the mother. Then you mm -hmm. go on to say, what Newman and others have recognized is that devotion to Mary doesn't mean passivity. Mm -hmm. Rather, her spiritual mother promotes a childlike docility and expectation with regard to her ability and authority to form us into other Christ. Mm -hmm. In your mind, what's the difference between being passive and being docile? Um, I think that um, incredibly different. Um, look at John Paul II, for instance. He was um, was not passive in the face of evil, but he was docile to the Holy Spirit. There's mm -hmm. a, a, a nimbleness there. Um, so I think that's the would be um, the, the distinction that you can still be um, open to what what the promptings are instead of just ignoring them outright. Mm -hmm. You say one commenter, commentator went so far as to suggest that the Protestant rejection of the veneration of Mary and its mm -hmm. various consequences uh, is one of the psychological reasons which explains the recent emergence of institutional feminism. Yeah. Um, this is a fascinating piece that I don't think that there's been enough research on. I'm actually working on a book um, focusing on these pieces. Um, hopefully it'll be out next year. But the idea behind that is because of the fact that uh, nuns and religious life for women was, was tossed out with everything else, mm -hmm. um, that there was no longer a sense of what it means to be a woman ordered to Christ. And we see in, in the contemplative life of, um, of nuns that there's a very different type of, of ordering to Christ that, that is, is a gift to women. Mm -hmm. um, in many respects, it mimics pregnancy, actually. It has um, their, their spiritual seeds that God plants mm -hmm. that the nun only knows about and then come 
to full flourishing. I think Mother's example of this network is a great example of that. That was a small seed and then turned into something. And this is what happens with children, is we, we know that we're pregnant and then um, our children go on to be something far more than we ever dreamed that they would be. Um, so I think having tossed those things out, the only thing for women to do, especially in Protestantism, is to try and become more like um, men and pastors and want to aspire after that because there's no unique place for them. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think this is, this is part of the roots of that, that problem that we're seeing today in the culture. Right. And the other book you're working on? Um, it's actually called The Anti-Mary. Um, well, I'm not sure what the title will be, but it's focused mm -hmm. on this idea of are we living in this age of an anti-Mary? It's, it's um, not as a person, but as a spirit that has um, taken over the culture. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's directly opposed to our lady, and this is why there's that big gap right. between uh, women today and Mary. Well, Our Lady said the final struggle will be over the family. Family, right? exactly. So yep. That seems like we're in part of it, at least. Thank <laughs> yes, you so thank much. Thank you. My pleasure. Talking with Dr. Carrie Gress about her book, The Marian Option, God's Solution to a Civilization in Crisis, published by TAN, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com. Check it out. It's worth your time. Join us next time right here on Book One.